Hi, welcome back to Guitar Discoveries and the fifth and final video in this series about what I learned from each of the Beatles. So far I've covered all of the Fab Four. John, Paul, George, Ringo. But what about the Beatles' fabulous fifth member? Now I'm referring, of course, to producer, arranger, and orchestrator George Martin. Now I was really young as each of the new Beatles LPs came out, and coincidentally, just as I was starting to read, the covers of American Beatles releases started to include a credit for producer George Martin. First time I remember seeing produced by George Martin was on Rubber Soul. And I wondered, what's a producer? I didn't know, but seeing that credit made me curious, and little did I know that recording and music production would become a direction for my whole career. Now, I imagine lots of people hearing Beatles records back then thought about how the sounds were being created and recorded, and how classical elements would magically show up and elevate the Beatles music into something more than typical pop records. And looking back, it's obvious that never before, or since, has the synergy between a band and producer been so evident or important? Now, there are detractors out there. People who say the Beatles were too highbrow, too classically influenced, too experimental. And those folks seem to lament that the Beatles' original rock and roll and rhythm and blues spirit, you know, their kind of punkiness in the early days, eventually got covered up in layers of more sophisticated musical elements. I mean, some people wanted them to be and stay more like the Rolling Stones. And I think that's why that question of which band is better, right, the Beatles or the Stones, is still asked way too often, right? That is certainly a question of apples versus oranges. They're totally different. As for me, I'm glad the Beatles music evolved so quickly and that George Martin helped them do so many things that had never been done before. So stay with me, I'm going to share the three most important things I learned from George Martin. Okay, real quick, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you haven't already. I have five years worth of music-related content on my channel, and I don't want you to miss any of the new videos as they come out. Okay, Sir George Martin. People think of him as a straight arrow, very proper, maybe even a little stuffy, but he had a very humble upbringing. His father Henry was a carpenter. His mother Bertha had to cook their meals at a communal stove in their apartment building. At age eight, George took six piano lessons, but then stopped and kept teaching himself. He actually taught himself music theory, and he wrote his first piano piece at age eight. Didn't hurt that he also had natural, perfect pitch. Well, then for quite a while, he strayed from music. He worked as a surveyor, he worked as a clerk in the war office, and he served in the Royal Navy for four years. But ultimately, that was a good thing because he used a veteran's grant to attend the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. His main instrument was piano, his second instrument was oboe, and he studied composition and orchestration. Important. Now, when he graduated, he worked for the BBC's classical music department. In 1950, he started working at EMI Records and managed their classical catalog, and he became co-founder of the London Baroque Society. 1955, Martin took over the small and struggling Parlophone label for EMI, and he actually managed to start racking up some hits, producing classical, original cast recordings, some jazz, but most notably, comedy records featuring folks like Peter Ustinov, Peter Sellers, and Dudley Moore. So George Martin was not a musical snob. A lot of people don't realize he was the first A&R person in England to sign a skiffle artist. And before he signed the Beatles, he'd already had some hits, including a UK number one with You're Driving Me Crazy by the Temperance Seven. Now, what does producing comedy have to do with what Martin did with the Beatles? Well, George says that he didn't sign the Beatles in 1962 because they'd written great songs. They hadn't at that point. They came down and they performed for me, and I immediately liked them. I thought they were great characters. Um, I wasn't sure what to do with them, but I liked them, so I signed them up. I had a feeling they were going to be good in some way, but um, certainly they, know, they gave no sign at that time anyway of being such great writers. So given that every other label in England had already rejected the Beatles, I seriously doubt George Martin would have signed them if he wasn't already comfortable with comedy, right? He, he recognized the commercial value of comedy. He'd already used some experimental recording techniques on the comedy hits that he'd produced. So in Martin's own words, 
working with the likes of Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan was very useful because as it wasn't music, you could experiment. We made things out of tape loops, slowed things down, and banged on piano lids. So that leads me to George Martin lesson number one, experiment and have fun. Right from the start, the Beatles used new and unusual recording techniques, like double tracking a lead vocal. I remember seeing that term on the back cover of Meet the Beatles. They described George Harrison's vocals on Don't Bother Me as double tracked. So you can hear and even feel that spirit of experimentation and fun on pretty much every song. I mean, a cool example is recording on tape at half speed and then playing it back at normal speed. Now, when you do that with vocals, you get a high-pitched chipmunk effect, but with instruments, it's not as obvious. Half-speed recording allowed for some virtuoso moments on Beatles records. One of them is the sped-up piano solo on In My Life. Here's George Martin to explain it. Drop the speed of the tape down to half what it is, so you hear everything an octave down. And then I could play the piano exactly the notes I wanted, quite effectively. It's rather like a Bach two-part invention. So when the tape is sped up to normal, the piano solo is impressive and almost sounds like a harpsichord. John loved it. So Martin used that technique a few other times. One of my favorites is the honky-tonk piano solo on Rocky Raccoon. If you want to hear more examples of Martin playing on Beatles songs, David Bennett Piano has a cool video about 27 Beatles songs that George Martin played on. Definitely worth checking out. So I think it's likely that Martin's comedy experience made him more tolerant of the Beatles' wacky side, certainly than most of the white lab-coated producers of the day would have been. And I mean, let's face it, the Beatles wrote a lot of playful songs. There are plenty of comedic moments, even on serious songs. And there are quite a few songs that I'd classify as novelty songs or even straight up comedy. I mean, I think it kind of took off when Yellow Submarine on Revolver became such a big hit with those weird nautical and underwater sounds. <laughs> That's a comedy collage, right? So Sgt. Pepper's had tongue-in-cheek songs like Lovely Read a Meter Maid for the Benefit of Mr. Kite and Good Morning, Good Morning. All together now. All together now. All together, all together, all together now. Hey, Bulldog. You know anymore? <laughs> you got it! That's it! You got it! <laughs> Don't look at me, man. I have ten children. But I think the Beatles' comedy peaked during the White Album because there's Back in the USSR, Birthday, Bungalow Bill, Piggies, Why Don't We Do It in the Road, Wild Honey Pie, Rocky Raccoon, and, you know, there are more. I mean, a lot of the White Album is wacky and wild. Now, probably their most overt comedy record is You Know My Name, Look Up the Number, which was the B-side of the Let It Be single. You know my name! <laughs> they even kept up the comedy right to the end, literally, on their last album, Abbey Road. Maxwell Silver Hammer, Mean Mr. Mustard, Polythene Pam. I mean, I think this all shows that George Martin wasn't a controlling stuffed shirt, right? That he had a subversive side. And I think he celebrated not squelched all the fun. All right, George Martin lesson number two, orchestral instruments are cool. So as I matured musically and, and really studied and came to understand how Martin contributed to the Beatles arrangements and recordings, I realized that he produced every song, even the early ones, from what I'd call an orchestral perspective. So with an orchestra, you're working with a wide variety of instruments in sections. You've got strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion. Right? And each section has a certain texture or a timbre, a sonic character to it. You've got strings, which are generally mellow and lush. You've got woodwinds, which are pastoral and organic. Brass, brilliant and inspiring. 
You got percussion, you know, which is rhythmic and propulsive. Now, what does the orchestra have to do with the early Beatles? Well, it's really about how sounds on a recording are arranged and layered. When you listen to any early Beatles song, it's notable how balanced all the elements are. I mean, I think George Martin and the recording engineers at EMI did a stellar job of recording the band in such a way that the full frequency range is exploited, right? You got Paul's bass down low and it's full for that time. The guitars have presence and energy, but somehow they don't get in the way of the vocals. And Ringo's drums are propulsive, even aggressive, but they don't get in the way either. And that is no mean feat, especially because they were mixing everything down to a single mono master. Now, George Martin often coached the Beatles on their arrangements, and he encouraged them to add instrumental hooks to keep things interesting at every moment in a song. So nearly every Beatles song has either a memorable musical intro riff to kick it off, or it launches directly into a verse or a chorus. I mean, it's those hooks that let us identify Beatles songs in the first few beats or notes of an intro. It's brilliant arranging. Here are just a few examples. There's an economy to every arrangement that respects our time and rewards us as listeners. So in 1965, George Martin started introducing actual orchestral instruments into Beatles songs, and he used them in ways that had never been done in pop music. You know, on Yesterday, it's not really the Beatles at all. It's Paul solo with his acoustic guitar and a string quartet. Mm -hmm. So some of my earliest conscious memories of orchestral instruments come from Beatles songs. And I always thought, wow, those instruments sound so cool. You know, in fact, George Martin's work with the Beatles is the key reason I started playing double bass in seventh grade. He made orchestra and orchestral instruments cool. And he proved over and over in his Beatles arrangements that orchestral instruments could even rock. I mean, most non-musicians don't really think about Eleanor Rigby, right? It's not the Beatles playing instruments. It's just Paul and a double string quartet with John and George adding harmony vocals on the choruses. I mean, that was a radical approach to a rock song back then. George Martin says those stabbing strings were inspired by Bernard Herrmann's score to the movie Psycho. I mean, what's more rock and roll than that? Now, my personal favorite George Martin orchestra arrangement is I Am The Walrus. The orchestra introduces the song and plays through the whole thing. And if you listen to it alone, it's a masterpiece of strange, dark, and beautiful parts. And it's all I can do to resist playing the whole thing for you right now. But here's a chunk. So 
So if you want to hear the whole arrangement, just go to guitardiscoveries.com. If you sign up as a guitar discoverer, you'll get free access to the complete orchestra part. It's really incredible. Okay, George Martin lesson number three, explore uncharted territory. So when Martin approached an orchestral arrangement traditionally, he could be as lush as any arranger, like a Nelson Riddle or a Gordon Jenkins. Check out the song Good Night from the White Album. But for a guy with a straight arrow reputation, he could really throw away the rule book and do the unexpected. You already heard some of I Am The Walrus, and we talked a little about speed effects for his piano solos. But one of his most creative uses of speed effects was on Strawberry Fields Forever. I did a complete song blow up about this, but here's the story of how George Martin and engineer Jeff Emmerich rose to an impossible John Lennon challenge and created the final mix. After 26 takes, some complete, some sections, and some reduction mixes of previous takes, John tells George Martin that he likes the beginning of the song from the original lighter version, specifically take seven, but that he likes the end of the song from the more intense version with the orchestra. So he wants to combine take seven and 26. And Martin has to give him the bad news that take 26 with the orchestra is at a faster tempo and a half step higher than take seven. And Lennon just looks at him and says, you can fix it, George. And against all odds, he did fix it. George Martin and EMI engineer Jeff Emmerich used two tape machines, both with Vera speed, and they matched the two takes as closely as possible in pitch and tempo. So George Martin was a classically trained composer and arranger, but working with the Beatles, he consistently thought outside the symphonic box. And because he knew the rules, he knew how to break them. He had a knack for choosing unusual instrument combinations, like Strawberry Fields, which uses three cellos and four trumpets. I mean, who'da thunk? Sometimes he has a really light touch, like on When I'm 64, he, he does an old time arrangement. It's played by two B flat clarinets and a bass clarinet. But then listen to how he channeled East Indian Raga through the lens of Western symphonic strings. This is on George Harrison's Sgt. Pepper song, Within You, Without You. I mean, where else are you ever going to hear eight violins and three cellos playing slides and bends like an Indian Dilruba? Now, we all know the massive 24-bar orchestral climax on A Day in the Life. And we knew we had to fill those bars with something sensational. And we didn't know what it was going to be yet. It was John Lennon's idea. He told Martin he wanted to create a tremendous build-up from nothing up to something absolutely like the end of the world. And then George Martin had to figure out how to communicate and orchestrate that for a bunch of classical musicians who were only used to playing the notes on a score. So this is how Martin explained it in his 1994 memoir, All You Need Is Ears. What I did was to write the lowest possible note for each of the instruments in the orchestra. At the end of the 24 bars, I wrote the highest note near a chord of E major. Then I put a squiggly line right through the 24 bars with reference points to tell them roughly what note they should have reached during each bar. Of course, they all looked at me as though I were completely mad. But it worked. All You Need Is Love has a Martin Orchestra arrangement that opens with the French national anthem, La Marseillaise, and near the end it has musical quotes from Green Sleeves, Glenn Miller's In the Mood, and a Bach invention. And he wrote the whole arrangement so it diverges and converges with what the band plays. <laughs> Finally, Martin's orchestral arrangements also frosted the whole cake of Abbey Road. Gorgeous strings on something. A 
lilting strings and woodwinds on Here Comes the Sun. And strings and brass on the side two medley, including Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight. By now it should be totally clear that George Martin was definitely the fifth Beatle and he had an impact on their music as big as any of the other four members of the band. Well, there you go, the three most important things I learned from George Martin. Number one, experiment and have fun. Number two, orchestral instruments are cool. And number three, explore uncharted territory. We can all learn from those lessons. Thank you, George Martin, for educating us all and creating the magical musical worlds you did. And while we're at it, thanks also for having your son, Giles Martin. You know, he's done such a great job of going back to the original master tapes and remixing all the Beatles classics so we can hear them in new ways, like the Cirque du Soleil Love soundtrack and, and all the original LPs that are now coming out in Dolby Atmos mixes. All right, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Say hello in the comments. And visit guitardiscoveries.com. You're going to hear my own original music over there, the music of my band Cosmic Spin, and you can watch over 200 videos now in the archives. Or just watch this.